All right, we're ready. Okay. Well, good morning, everybody. I'm Bar Barb Monarchs, and um, I uh, have the, I don't know, luck or whatever to have been retired now since January, except to go out and do awesome. public education stuff for CareFi. And um, since I retired as their full-time educator, um, they haven't replaced me yet. So I still get to come in and do things like orientation and get things pulled together for that kind of stuff. So I'm still around. I teach nationally for Air and Surface Transport Nurses Association, the trauma courses for those guys. And then I also teach uh, PhDLS and a few other things in our education department there. So I kind of still have my hand in, maybe till January. <laughs> <laughs> I'm really enjoying retirement though. But this is really fun for me. I've been a paramedic 23 years. I've been an RN for 42 years. So I've been in EMS most of my life. Um, been a flight nurse, been a ground ambulance nurse, paramedic, all that kind of stuff. So I know exactly what you guys see and what you're going through when you're out there on those scenes. And you know, the reason I always come to East Fork whenever they put out a thing for East Fork is you guys are the most fun. And when we get to rendezvous with you on the helicopter, which I haven't done in a, probably about a year, it is just a blast. Because you know what you're doing, you take care of the patients really well, and you're super collaborative. And so that's, that's one of the reasons I like coming here to teach. So the objectives, the things we're going to look at, we're going to talk about excited delirium syndrome. Kind of understand the scope of the problem and what happens in the brain with excited delirium and why it hits all these different parts of the body and makes the patients so sick that they immediately die. And they usually die either on the scene with PD or right as soon as we get them in our transport vehicle, whatever that may be. The last two I saw die were in ground ambulance when I was working in Merced, California. And then the other one was in, in my helicopter um, when I was going out of Modesto. So two different places, two different things, and they just freaking die on you. And, you know, they can be talking to you, squawking, making a lot of noise, and then they're dead. So let's look at kind of what happens pathophysiologically and what we can do to maybe stop that. We'll talk about the uh, signs and symptoms of it, things that we're going to see. Our kind of approach, the approach that we're going to want to try and take for these kind of patients to, to mitigate that before they get to that point where they actually, you know, just die in front of you. And then... Um, kind of understanding of what kills these patients. So typical delirium, and who's seen it? Have you guys all seen patients with excited delirium? It's crazy. Most of these patients are naked. So what happens with these guys is they get this crazy stuff going on in their brain. Hi. Hi. I'm sorry to interrupt. No, please go ahead. Callahan's coming in, so we don't need to do any movements. He's going to text you when he gets to 12 about whether he comes down here to join this or not. Okay. okay? Sorry. No, no problem. Thank, Thank you. Thank you. So you'll see in this video kind of what it looks like. And this is super typical of the ones that I've seen. There he is right there. Hey, get on the ground. Hey, get on the ground. Sets them off is that they, you know, they start out 
minding their own business, uh, being crazy in their head, and then um, and then they uh, and then they get all this hyper acute stuff going on around them. And we'll talk a little bit more about how that works inside the brain, and one of the things that um, keeps keeps them hyperthermic, and a few other things that go on. So you've seen what it looks like. The history is it's been around 150 years. I mean, I can tell you that probably before this last decade, I've been a nurse 42 years. Before this last decade, or probably 15 years, I had never heard of or seen excited delirium before. Worked in ERs and in EMS the entire time. And so I'd never seen it before, and there is a reason why that kind of came on. So 1949, Dr. Bell, Bell's mania, was described with hallucination, profound agitation, fever, and oxygen <coughs> death. And that was before cocaine. That was before people were just using it recreationally and using that kind of stuff. That was just people that had that kind of crazy delirium going on in their brain, and the dopamine overreacting in their brain. And so that, that was a little bit different. So by the time the 1950s came around, which is, by the way, before I became a nurse, <laughs> a couple decades, um, they started using antipsychotic medications, things like Haldol, things like, um, what are the other ones? Some of the other psychiatric meds that they use for those crazy schizophrenic patients. And they would use that for alcohol withdrawal, which is another thing you see this excited delirium in. And, um, and uh, they kind of slowed everything down. It kind of slowed down that um, ability to see these patients on a regular basis. And then uh, in the 1980s and, and early 1990s, cocaine was really a fun drug. You know, it was a great thing. Everybody, everybody, everybody had tried cocaine at that point. And so one of the things that cocaine does and all the other stimulants like amphetamine and methamphetamine which is pretty prevalent right you guys have a big meth problem down here mm -hmm. we do everywhere right i live in washoe valley we call that sun valley south down there because it's, we just have so many meth abusers down there and you know you can see them at the little grocery store down there with no teeth and very skinny people um so those are some of the things that kind of happen Fatality rate with um, excited delirium is up to 10%. So one in 10 patients that get this is probably going to die. So those are the things that you worry about. 75% of the deaths happen on the scene or during transport, just like we looked at before and talked about before. Uh, they often die within an hour of police involvement. So they get crazy enough that someone calls 911, the police get involved, they also stimulate that patient, and their typical thing to do is what you just saw. How many police officers do you, did you see on that one patient? At least 12. Yeah, somewhere between 8 and 12 police officers. And, you know, that is super hyper stimulation for those kind of patients that already have catecholamine overload going on, right? Um, high risk of litigation for us. Because everybody at the scene with their smartphone saw Chuck running around being normal, and then we put him in our ambulance and he died. So the family members, the whiskey tango neighbors, all the people that are in that neighborhood are the people that you're going to worry about, you know, thinking that they should be suing us. So keep that in mind that any of these kind of patients you really have to document super well on. Um, it's a brain disorder, basically, and it's normally related to any kind of stimulants. So all those things. Uh, LSD can have it, you know, it can be with LSD. Not so commonly. I, I don't think I've ever seen it with LSD patients. And they get crazy and stimulated sometimes, but it, it doesn't affect their brain like these things. Cocaine, angel dust, methamphetamine, and basalt. Do you guys have basalt? A lot of basalt patients down here too. Not a lot. Yeah. Um, I yeah. have a ton in urine. That's that's a crazy group right there. And then the psychiatric <laughs> patient. <laughs> Ooh, let me tell you, Bell's mania is that psychiatric patient. And then you can get this neuroleptic malignant syndrome, which really has the same exact pathophysiology, but they get it from. Um, withdrawing from uh, antipsychotic medicines most of the time, taking themselves off their meds, and then they can get exactly the same pathophysiology, and we'll talk about that. 
So dopamine is uh, a drug we've used, right, for a long time in EMS and healthcare. How it works in the brain, though, is it is a catecholamine and it's a neurotransmitter. So I'll show you a picture in a second of how it works. Pictures help me actually learn how to do this stuff. It's responsible for your motivation. Dopamine is not a feel-good drug, even though it's called the feel-good drug. It really gets you motivated to do something and remember something that gave you that nice feeling afterwards, which is associated with maybe exercise, running, sex, all those things that make you feel good afterwards. Um, so eating, that's why people overeat because eating stimulates that, and they remember that eating made them feel better one time, and so now they're going to eat all the time. They kind of stuff their faces rather than, you know, rather than figuring out what it is that's making them feel bad. It stimulates hormones at the pituitary gland. It also affects the um, uh, hypothalamus. Hypothalamus is re responsible for your temperature regulation, right? So that's another one of those things where it actually works on those specific parts of your body. Um, so it, um, it works in three or four different areas of your brain to motivate you to keep the hormones how they should be and <coughs> other things. It regulates your short-term memory and cognition. So it helps you kind of understand what's going on around you, to a point. So with excited delirium, there's not necessarily an overproduction, there is a blockage to the reuptake, so that it, it all is circulating around in there all the time, firing, 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 firing impulses between um, the synapse in the neur neurons, I guess. So each neuron has got way too much dopamine circulating in there. So what does dopamine do to our heart and vasculature? Heart rate. Yeah, it shoots up your heart rate, shoots up your blood pressure. So these guys have an excess of dopamine in their brain. They also have an excess of dopamine in the rest of their body. So they have this hyperexcitability. They're tachycardic. They're probably going to be hypertensive initially to a point. And they're going to get really hot. It causes... It's kind of that whole, too much of a good thing, causes motivation without cognition. It really messes up their ability to understand what's going on, and they're just in this kind of psychotic state. It st stimulates their fight or flight response because they're freaked out about everything. If you saw that guy, that's typical. They're either mad or scared. One of those two things. They're either running from you, 100 miles an hour, you can't catch them. The one that I got in my grand ambulance in Merced, we were um, following the guy and the police <laughs> to try and catch this guy. He was bouncing off cars both sides of the road. No idea what he was doing, but he was just going, going, going. He ended up driving out into a, a tomato field. His car got stuck. He got out and ran, and he ran so he, I mean, he had to run like almost a half a mile. And the police were chasing him. They're like, <coughs> catch me, kill myself. <laughs> and they finally catch up with him and get him down. He slumps down on the ground. They didn't even have to restrain him, and he just died. By the time we got up to him, he was dead. He was probably 22 years old. I mean, these are not. this is not a typical thing you see in a 22-year-old that just die like that. Causes hyperthermia, and that's, like I said, that's from that stimulation of the hypothalamus. And so... They get really, really hot, and that doesn't help them at all with the other stuff that's going on. And it either depresses or overcomes this parasympathetic. So they can't downregulate any of the other stuff. Yeah? How long, <clears throat> how long does it last in that, when they're in that state? When they're in that state, depends on what it is that's causing it, but I'll give you some clues to fixing it. You guys can fix it really quick. What drugs do you carry for? Haldol. Haldol. Haldol? Haldol. You don't have ketamine? No, I don't. I think you need ketamine. You'll see, it's my favorite drug on earth. We think so too. We're trying. Okay. <laughs> if I can give you any information on ketamine, yeah, I have all kinds of literature about how safe it is and how much safer it is for you guys to have ketamine too, especially with these patients. You can give it intranasally. 
you don't even have to get poked by these patients if you're trying to do a needle stick or anything. It's a great drug. But we'll talk about that in a minute, yeah. Depends on it depends on a lot of things, but it'll I mean these guys normally end in a bad way unless you intervene. Unless we intervene as EMS. So this is with the normal dopamine stimulation. Um, and these are the receptor sites down here. It comes out of one end of the synapse. These are dopamines here. And they land on all the receptors. There's usually five on each neuron, five receptors on each neuron. And then anything that doesn't get used, it gets squirted out into that cleft, goes back into this reuptake system right here, gets sucked back in there and put back into a little sphere to be shot back out into the cleft when the patient needs it or when the dopamine that's sitting on the receptor sites has become ineffective and it'll drop off, go back up and get cleaned up again and go back. So pathophysiology with cocaine or any other stimulant um, basically blocks these things. So these little green things of the cocaine, they block it. The reuptake can't happen. So they'll have you know, those five little receptor sites will have uh, dopamine sitting on them, and now you've got free-floating dopamine in between. In between all these neuron clefts, you have free-floating. So there's no time for the dopamine to uh, settle back and, and recirculate and work like it's supposed to, and it doesn't ever go back in. So a lot of these patients, after they've had this situation, they don't do well, because their dopamine is really low after that. They, it, it just doesn't work for them anymore. It causes them to have those pathological high levels of dopamine. Causes them to have paranoia, delusions, psychoses, all the things that you saw with that crazy guy at the beginning, Chuck. Um, and why are they naked? Why are they getting naked? Uh, they're they're hot. Yeah, they're trying to cool off. They're super hot. One of the things you can always count on if you have a crazy psychotic patient that's naked and is sweaty, that's probably excited delirium. That's one of the first things that's a classic sign that you can really tell that that's what's going on. Obviously, it dysregulates temperature, affects centers in the brain that control the cardiac uh, rate and rhythm, and their rates are sometimes in the 180 to 200 range. Don't be surprised if you see that. <clears throat> Uh, yeah, they have elevated, the elevated shock proteins are something they can test for later to see if they had, um, if that, if it was truly really excited delirium, but that's not something we're going to look at. So how to identify it, typically men between 16 and 45 years old, um, they have, they may have a history of psychostimulant use or mental illness, one or the other. A lot of them are those. Um, bipolar patients that are on medications for their mania and they feel pretty good in the interim and they take them off they take themselves off their drugs that's what normally happens and these guys can end up with that Bell's mania just from coming off the drugs so they get they get a lot of uh, the same thing happens coming off those drugs which increase the reuptake um, will cause them to have uh, decreased reuptake of that dopamine and they have a plethora of it kind of run around in their system causing problems. So law enforcement and EMS, we almost always get called for a crazy person, public disturbance, something going on, a naked man on the road, you know, something crazy like that. Sudden onset of violent combative behavior, paranoia and fear. Those guys are either mad or scared. And so keep in mind that they're going to be one or the other, and you can get hurt. So be careful and make sure you got lots of help. Superhuman strength, physical. I saw one guy break his own arm in cuffs trying to get out of it. He, he had no idea he was hurting himself. That's how crazy they get with this. So um, don't be surprised if you have somebody who is a smaller kind of a person that can whip you. <laughs> You think, gosh, this guy should be easy. Uh -uh, no, sometimes they're really strong. Elevated temperature, heart rate, rapid breathing, elevated BP, skin, sweaty skin. Sweaty skin is a big clue right there. Naked, hot, sweaty skin. Those are the things that <coughs> crazy, um, excited, delirium patients. 
drug intoxication <clears throat> without um, excited delirium are not hyperthermic. Those are just those crazy drug intoxicated folks. And we do see those, right? Sometimes we see them just because they're 28 and having their first MI because of their stimulant use, right? Mm -hmm. Differential diagnoses, hypoglycemia, de decompensated psychiatric thyroid abnormalities. Um, I did take care of a guy one time at Burning Man that was a thyroid guy. He was in thyroid crisis. And um, we thought that he was on drugs. His friends swore he never took drugs. He didn't look like a guy that took drugs. But, you know, that was kind of the deal. Um, so think about those things as well. Severe sweating combined with hallucinations make you always think about it. Very sick. <coughs> so I don't know if you can see this. This is a, this is out of one of the studies that talks about um, how how folks are managing or using using criteria in their protocols to actually medicate patients for excited delirium. And this one here uh, is Seattle's. Um, criteria, Vancouver, and Lenox, I don't know where that is, but I don't know where the other two are. And basically they all say extreme agitation, violence, res um, resistance, struggling, aggression, inappropriate. The second one is all, you know, about getting naked and being sweaty, <clears throat> being sweaty and hot. Um, both these places in Seattle and Vancouver, <coughs> excuse me, this little sore throat thing going on, have to do with uh, superhuman strength, you know, that Superman power kind of thing. Um, Vancouver and Seattle both talk about rapid breathing. These patients are acidotic. So what you don't want to do is slow down their breathing. If they start to look like their, temp or their breathing is slowing down and like they're calming down for you, get scared because they're about to code. So let them breathe as fast as they can breathe and let them hyperventilate to try and fix some of that. They're always panicky, scared, and then the things that um, should scare you are sudden tranquility, uh, skin discoloration, any of that kind of stuff should get you scared. Make you really worry about that patient getting ready to circle the drain and you have to work really, really hard to, to get them back. So no study has pro uh, proven that tasing the patient kills them. They've done a lot of studies <coughs> because they used to think, oh yeah, it's that electrical stimulus from the taser. But they um, have proven basically that doesn't matter if they tase them or don't tase them. The ones that are going to die are going to die. The ones that don't die are not going to die, <clears throat> whether they get tased or not. The problem is when they prone these guys and put cuffs on them and put their head, their knee on the back of their neck or sit on their chest wall, that's when these patients start to go down really quickly. So it has to do with uh, their respiratory depression and the, not, the inability to continue to have that hyperventilation going on because the acidosis is what takes them down eventually. And a lot of these patients that are on these stimulants are susceptible to ischemia and dysrhythmias anyway just because of their, you know, because of the abuse and the stimulants. So um, that, that kind of predisposes them to have that, ah, thank you so much that sudden cardiac death thing. Um, all pre-hospital cases are due to respiratory arrest or cardiac dysrhythmias. In the hospital, when these guys, if they do survive and get to the hospital, they see these things. They see rhabdomyolysis, DIC, and renal failure in them. So that severe acidosis and all the things that happen, remember their muscles are almost in that you know, in that clonus, they're in that very, um, very tense situation. They're, you know, just running crazily, and and they end up with uh, lots of problems based on that, and they die from that. <clears throat> so, the best response is a dual response from law enforcement, obviously, and EMS. And it'd be great if we could all be there at the same time. But normally, what happens is someone calls law enforcement. Law enforcement gets there. They may try and talk the guy down. 
They may wait, you know, a little while before they call us to get there for this guy, thinking they could maybe calm him down. Some they can, not most of them, though. And then um, the, the patient is so far down that continuum, by the time they get them controlled and they call for us to transport them, that they do um, pass on to a different place. So for law enforcement, basically, they need to consider having lots of help. And they need to consider kind of surrounding the guy, but giving him room. These guys hopped on this guy based on the fact that he looked like he was going to hurt himself or go into somebody else's domain and hurt them. So they had to kind of hop on him and get him out of there. You want to try and reduce stimuli as you can. If he's sitting in a corner quietly, the police need to have you guys come and dart him from across the room. Okay, so Haldol does work really well for excited delirium. The other drug that I would consider for you guys is Versat. Versat benzodiazepines work super well in these patients. <clears throat> they do help with the heart rate a little bit. They will lower the blood pressure a little bit. And so I don't know if you have a protocol for that or you have the ability to call and get orders for that, but benzos work well for these patients. That's what we use typically. Yeah. And do you give it IM? Yeah. Make sure you just get them, dart them, walk away. Or we can do it intranasally too. Intranasally is great as well. The thing that we worry about with these crazy patients <laughs> is someone's going to get stuck. And a lot of them are IV drug abusers. So, you know, if you get stuck, try to get an IV. You know what it's like putting an IV in somebody like this. Yeah. You get it in, they pull it out. You get it in, they pull it out. You get it in, they yank their arm back and blood's flying all over. You get it in your face. And, crazy so you know the more you can uh, it, you know kind of keep the needle thing out of the way until you get them kind of settled the better and internasal is a wonderful way to do that for these guys <coughs> and then just wait just sit down and wait so we'll talk in the next the next um, slide series I have is about sedation and analgesia. We'll talk a lot more about how and how it works and why it, it is a really good drug for this, but why it probably isn't the best drug for this. So they got to grab the guy, quickly put him into restraints. They can tase him, and that wouldn't be a bad thing, really. It's not, it's not associated with death. It doesn't cause them to have any more mortality than anything else that they do to control them. And then as soon as they get him restrained, then that's when you guys come in and give them a quick dart and try and get them out of the situation. If you can put them inside your cool ambulance, shut the doors, decrease stimulation, turn off the lights. A lot of times these guys will calm down pretty quickly after they've been medicated and you can uh, kind of control the situation at that point. Ensure that they are breathing well. Avoid hindering their ability to breathe and breathe fast. No chest pressure at all. If you have to even just loosen up seat belts and whatever else to kind of keep the, these people able to take those fast, deep breaths, that's really good. You have to really monitor these guys because they, if they start slowing down, you should be scared. They're super acidotic. We already talked about that. Normal or calm breathing means that they're about ready to code. So keep those things in mind and be ready to um, resuscitate. Obviously, if they arrest, you want to get their um, arms free so you can use, you can get in there and do CPR. Are you throwing them on a mask or anything real quick, especially when they're restrained? Yeah, and most of the time, if you can do that, if you can do that at the same time, even a cannula, because a lot of times they panic with the mask on and want it off and they're just fighting, fighting, fighting. But if you stick a cannula on them and crank it up to 15, mm -hmm. it has the same effect or even better effect than putting a mask on those patients because they don't feel like someone's holding them so they can't breathe. So yeah, it, any way that you can get these guys in oxygen is good. Um, rapid sedation is going to help fairly high doses. And remember, because they're hypermetabolic, they metabolize it super fast. So something that you would expect to take three or four minutes to actually start working, starts working within a minute usually. And um, one of the other things is redose them often. So if you're thinking about Versad or you're thinking about Haldol, you might actually need to cut in half the amount of time you spend in between doses waiting for <coughs> to work.
and this, I'm sorry, this is really small, but it does, it does tell you that one of the things it talks about midazolam, lorazepam, diazepam, all the PAMs, Haldol, Droperidol. Did you guys ever use Droperidol in this system? It was a great drug, wasn't yeah, it? It was a great drug. Do you have it again? No. A lot of EMS systems are going back to it. Because one of the things that we do that they didn't do in hospitals when they black boxed it is we put them on monitors. Yeah. We put all these patients on monitors. So they black box it because it, it um, QT, QT prolong, prolonged the QT interval. Same wow. thing. I mean, how about this too? Look at you. I know. Right came right out. Came right out. Damn. <laughs> but you know, there's several several big EMS uh, systems in the in the country are going back to it. So Denver has it again. I think uh, Fort Worth has it again. There's several places. It's a great drug. It works super fast. It stops them from feeling like they're going to bark. It works really well as a yeah. sedation. It's quick. Um, so basically, they're talking about the dose and onset and how you would give it. <clears throat> so how dolls I am or IV only, unfortunately. And I am, you can give 10 to 20 milligrams, and the onset's about 15 minutes if you give it I am. So you got a long time to sit there with those patients waiting for it to start working. And sometimes you have to redose it in about 10 minutes if they're really in that hyperacute state. So don't, don't be afraid to use it a little bit more often. I had um, one of the protocols when I was flying to Dallas, before we had ketamine on our any of our um, EMS rigs anywhere. We had Haldol, and we alternated every five minutes with five of Versed, five of Haldol, five of Versed, five of Haldol, five of Versed, five of Haldol, to try and get them under control. And it normally took 30 minutes to get these guys down, enough that we could actually transport them without, you know, fear. The one thing I'm gonna point out here is that Ketamine IM takes three to five minutes to peak. And IV, it takes one minute. So that's the reason why it really is the better drug for this kind of a thing, for excited delirium. It is by far the best drug you're going to find. Yeah. Uh, you're saying you're alternating between Percet and Haldol continuously. At what point do you get a little nervous that you might be getting too much Percet? When they stop breathing. Okay. So that's what you're, I mean, so you're just going for it. You want, yeah, you got to get them down, down, down. And that's, that was what we had in our armamentarium at that point. I don't know, you know, what your medical director thinks about using it that often. But, you know, we had RSI as well, because we were in a helicopter. Mm -hmm. So we could easily RSI the patient and then if we had to. But, you know, those are all considerations. Am I? Yeah. Oh, sorry. On this one. Okay, good. I'm a sorry. <laughs> but how well does work really well? It just takes a long time. It takes up to 15 minutes. And that's the I am route. It'll take about 10 minutes IV to start really knocking them down enough that you can start thinking about maybe your second dose. Post sedation, once you get these guys in the back of your rig, they're sedated, they seem like they're kind of coming along and feel a little bit better and things are things are settling down for you, actively cool them. So get a wet sheet on them, turn on the air conditioner, put your coats on if it's winter time and turn on the air conditioner. You know, um, you really want to cool, cool them down. Cold packs of their grind and armpits, Tylenol, aspirin, Ibuprofen, none of that stuff works for this. It is a, it's a tweak in the brain, so you're going to have to actively cool them with, you know, external means. Um, you really want to keep a good eye on their temperature, too. If you have a long transport, you're taking these guys to Carson or to Reno, make sure that you have a good eye on their temperature and watch it. Make sure it isn't climbing as you're going, because you want to make sure you get it down, down, down. And once you get it Somewhere in the 99 to 100 range, you're probably okay to stop actively cooling. But these guys can do 105, 106, 108. So don't, you know, don't forget that piece. IV fluids, absolutely. Once they calm down and you can easily start an IV and not have to fight with them, give them IV fluids. 
They've probably been sweating. They've been using up their reserves of their you know, fluids for a while. So go ahead and give them a liter. You're not going to hurt them. Most of them are those young men that we talked about. So don't be, don't be stingy with the IV fluids. And remember, let them hyperventilate. If they're not hyperventilating, my guys, be careful. <laughs> If they're not hyperventilating, you want them to hyperventilate. Whoa! <laughs> Whoa. Wow. wow! Wow! That was sorry. Nice. Add a love. Uh -huh. I got it. Apologize for that. That's okay. I've seen it before. <laughs> um, remember, if they're not hyperventilating on their own, you may want to help them hyperventilate. This guy has got a lot of acidosis, so you're going to want to blow that off to try and help him. Uh, get back to this moment today. End titles around 30 are normal for these. If they, if you see the end titles starting to drop, 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 even lower, and they seem like they're getting quieter, that's when they don't have circulation. So make sure you keep a good eye on that as well. Give them IV fluid bolus is important too. They can get hyperkalemic. So what happens to the muscle cells when they get in that kind of tetany and these guys are running and being crazy is that the potassium comes out into the bloodstream. And what do we know about hyperkalemic patients in their cardiac rhythm? Yeah, that can really mess them up, right? So this is, this is hypokalemia. This is the best picture I can find. It's got both. And then this is the hyperkalemia. And this, this patient has a six and a half potassium. Seven, eight, and nine. So that's what they look like when they have hyperkalemia. So you want to make sure that you manage the hyperkalemia. And the easiest way to do that is just give them a nebulized treatment of albuterol. That's one of the things that helps drive it back into the cells. So I don't know if you have protocols for that, but that's one of the easiest ways for you to fix a hyperkalemic patient is to give them a, a treatment of albuterol. You can ask for orders for calcium chloride. Now, calcium is a great drug to use. You give them a, a, just one burst of jet of calcium chloride, and it doesn't, it doesn't combat the potassium at all, but it stabilizes the cell wall and the cardiac muscle so that the hyperkalemia can't hurt it, can't make it you know, hyperreactive and have these patients not have the ability to have their heart squeeze anymore. Bicarb can also help drive the potassium back into the cell. Problem with bicarb is that it, you know, it'll neutralize it for a second and then whew, comes right back up. And so those patients have a lot of problems with it as well. Sometimes what they'll do with these bad hyperkalemic patients from this kind of stuff is just like you do in rhabdo, just like you do in a lot of things, is you put a put an amp of bicarb in a liter of IV fluid and just run that in. So that gives you a little bit more staying power. It doesn't peak like a bolus and then drop off really quick. So bicarb is, a, is not a bad idea, and it's a good thing to think about for your patients, and we all carry it. <clears throat> Obviously, you've got to get these guys to the closest emergency department. Um, and you guys have a good ER here. I mean, they have good docs, good nurses here. So you don't have to worry about having to take them somewhere far away unless you're doing the inner facility afterwards, right? Right. So keep them well restrained, even if you have them knocked down. The reason you want to is because, remember, they're super hypermetabolic, and they're going to chew up all the drugs that you give them pretty quickly, and then all of a sudden you're going to have this crazy combative person again. Law, um, have law enforcement come with you if you can, and keep an eye on their core temps. So remember, detailed picture of the call for your PCR. You really want to try and keep yourself safe from litigation. And litigation is a big deal for these kind of patients because they're young, usually healthy, strong, you know, young men that were talking at the scene and then dead. It also, the nice thing it does also is improves our understanding of the syndrome itself. You can use that as a, as a call review to, to help train each other, right? We always talk about our craziest, weirdest, you know, worst call ever in our staff meetings so that everybody gets to learn about all the things that happen and why. Um, it helps you with litigation and then it helps identify patients that you may come on again who's had excited delirium for some reason. Let's watch this too. She's going to have it. Yeah, she's going to have it. 
on the air. Maybe. <laughs> Once again, captured a tense encounter between police and the citizens they are sworn to protect. But this one ended on a death, but an applause, and a man heading to the hospital. Saturday afternoon, a man was naked, rolling around naked. the street, not naked. making any sense. Mm -hmm. Officers recognized the guy's actions were more of a medical emergency than criminal activity, and took special precautions to get him help. In a story you'll see only on KXOI, four ship Humphrey joins us now live at Broadway and Elm, where neighbors got an eyeful but also applauded police for their efforts. Jeff? Maybe like some of our police activities, this particular standoff went long enough for neighbors to record some of it on their cell phones. From his vantage point, Benjamin Blazovich, he wasn't sure what was about to happen, so he had his camera rolling just in case. It was the sound of this man's screams that brought Benjamin Blazovich and his friend Nick to the end of this Broadway Avenue alley. Well, at first it was kind of a shot when we walked around the corner and there's a naked dude <laughs> screaming a bunch of random stuff. Because of recent critical incident training, Sergeant Tony Giannetto knew the man was suffering from excited delirium and first called for paramedics. And then we noticed all the cops are showing up. Yeah. <laughs> and then he's flopping in the street doing his naked thing. By then, the sergeant already told dispatchers he would need at least four officers to contain but not crowd their subject. We recognize that excited delirium is a medical issue, and it is not as if we were chasing a fleeing bank robber or some crime in progress, so our main concern is to make sure the person stays safe and that they don't present a danger to anybody else. Keeping an excited delirium patient calm includes not using lights and sirens at the scene. The man obviously wasn't armed, and so police kept all of their tools in their holsters. Nobody had anything drawn on them. They were all just kind of standing around, and then he got up and tried to run, I guess you could say, and then the cop just kind of grabbed him, and then everybody just swarmed in. Excited delirium patients have racing heartbeats and rapidly overheating bodies. Taking the precaution of staging paramedics nearby dramatically sped up this man getting the medical treatment he needed. Is it really true that the neighbors clap? Yes, I was actually one of them. And I, 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 I said, good job. Okay, man. Good job. Good job. Maybe when police are caught behaving badly on cell phone video, it almost always makes the news, so we thought it was only fair to show you that the police officers using some of their new critical incident training successfully. It doesn't always go this well, particularly when weapons are involved, but even that naked man told police once he was on that gurney that he realized the officers were there to help him. Reporting live in West Central Spokane, Jeff Humphrey, KXLY4. You guys have any questions? Mm -hmm. No? Not it's really? crazy. It's, not, it's crazy when that stuff happens. Oh, man. It is crazy. Yeah. And the bad thing is, they just die. That, it, yeah. 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 The only one I've ever had died. Yeah. We, uh, if we could, I'd like to get some information about the ketamine because uh, our, our new medical director said whatever you guys want, present it to me, and if, if you Give me your me. email address, and what I'll do is I will um, email you a whole bunch of, there's probably about seven or eight um, good EMS studies out there that talk about the efficacy, the safety, and all the things that go with it. Awesome. So I'll give you, a, um, it'll be in this next lecture too when I talk about sedation and stuff, how well Academy works for pain and sedation as well. Okay. And so um, we'll, um, We'll kind of explore that, but if you give me your email address, I'll send you all that stuff. And awesome. Present it. Thank yeah. you. Do you guys want to take about a 10-minute break? Yeah, so real quick, Barb. So yeah. the, the reason why going to the closest ED would be more so they could um, chemically restrain and invade this patient? If they need uh, to, if yeah. They need you, to. Yeah, if the patient needs to be. The thing they want to manage really quickly is their temperature and their heart rate. Sure. And sometimes the benzos don't, and the Haldol don't necessarily do that. Sometimes they need to give them beta blockers. Okay. And I don't know if you guys carry them, but we only carried one, I think. And, you know, not it's not in our protocol to do it. Right. So you want to get to some place that can get them at least their heart rate down, their blood pressure down, and their sure. temperature down. So. Sure. Sometimes they just put them in the ice blankets and and uh, manage that, stabilize them a little bit, and then get them out. And then transport. Yeah. Okay. Perfect. So you may be taking them again. <laughs> yeah. No. No. <laughs> and probably fine. a better state. <laughs> Hopefully, anyway. Yeah. Exactly. Perfect. Yeah. Yeah. We can take a quick five ten minutes. Yeah. That'd be great. Go from there. You bet.
Take a break. Grab some coffee. Perfect. Can I get you a cup or anything? Or no, can... I'm good. I have some. Actually. Okay. Is there a pause button on this do that yeah, or? Sure. Yeah, there is. Yeah, you guys get signed in. Okay. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. How long were you in Modesto? Uh, I was there six years. Oh, really? As the med what? manager in Modesto for the helicopter program. Oh, where'd you get fired? Out of? Uh, out of the hospital. Yeah, you said. Okay. okay. Let's talk about analgesia, pain, and sedation for EMS. If you guys have questions about any specific medications that I don't talk about here, I probably have given them at some point in my life, and I'm happy to go over them with you. So we'll talk about that too. So there's the objectives. I have to put those out there so State EMS likes it, and then we you have to have an objective that we can teach class. So we're going to talk about sedation, we're going to use, um, talk about pain and pathophysiology and some of the things that happen to the body when pe people are in acute pain that doesn't get relieved. So pain is the problem for us. Over 80% of calls for ambulances are because of somebody has a perception of pain, right? Somebody's hurting. <clears throat> it may not be the worst pain you've ever seen, but it's probably the worst pain they've ever had at that point. It's super common for us to go. And keep in mind that um, according to CDC and Medicare and everybody else who pays for service, pain is a medical emergency. And making sure that we take care of it is really important. So acute pain, rather than us giving somebody, you know, 50 Norco a month or something, is a different deal. So make sure that you don't get caught up in that whole narcotic craziness that, you know, we got to be careful about who we give narcotics to. When you have a patient that's in acute pain, give them narcotics. It's a great drug. They're great drugs. They work really well. Uh, we often don't treat or under-treat pain for our patients, and especially in children. Don't be scared to give kids pain meds. And the nice thing is, you can give pain med meds in Hi, guys. Welcome back. Hello. things that happen with acute pain is that it activates the pituitary adrenal axis and suppresses immunity when you're having acute pain. So what do we have with this trauma patient? So you got someone who's, you got a fractured femur, they've got, you know, a shoulder out, they've got all the things that happen with those bad trauma patients. And then um, we may not treat them enough. That suppresses their immunity. And then what happens? They get septic in the hospital and they can die from that. Because remember, 65% of patients with acute sepsis die. So the sepsis thing is really scary, and one of the things we want to try and stop. It causes sympathetic activation, can lead to cardiac ischemia, or it can lead to a, a paralytic ileus. And that means your gut stops working. So if your gut stops working, what happens then <coughs> is that the capillaries start getting filled up and they leak. In, and what happens with leaky capillaries in the gut is that the patients get septic. 65% of septic patients die that have severe sepsis. So those are all the things that happen just from having acute pain that doesn't get treated. It increases the metabolism and oxygen demand and further exacerbates shock. So if you have a shocky patient or someone that you're worried is going to be shocky, they may have a pressure, blood pressure that's okay, but if they're tachycardi, you're thinking shock, right? So you want to always think about giving these guys a little bit of a pain medication. It may slow all that down and actually fix them with their sympathetic stimulation. It also causes psychological responses, which include anxiety and chronic depression. They can get chronic depression just from having <coughs> untreated um, acute pain. So don't be afraid to give them pain meds. So underlying pain also stimulates the inflammatory mediators, and that's a problem, right? What happens with the inflammation? They get surge, right? That's that whole syndrome of uh, system systemic inflammation causes sets patients up to get septic and die. So you got to remember that you got to keep these guys in a position where they're not going to get that inflammatory process going. The endocrine system reacts by release of hormones. <coughs> so they start chewing up carbs, proteins, and fats, and then they get 
weight loss on the long term from unrelieved pain, tachycardia, and increased respiratory rate because they have increased the metabolism just from the pain itself. So those are all the things that happen to them. Acute pain always results in chronic pain and can cause neuralgias. And so patients, you see those patients that have, I don't know, what is it called, fibromyalgia and all those things that we don't really believe in but are really real to them. And I do actually believe in it, but my husband who's a paramedic doesn't. He laughs at it. He says chronic fatigue syndrome. <laughs> anyway, so um, a lot of that is because at some point in their life, they had acute pain that was never relieved. And now they have this feedback mechanism from wherever that, um, wherever that trigger point is, it feed, feeds back to the brain and tells it it's having pain, even if it's not having pain. So it's one of those feedback mechanisms that's kind of gone awry during the, uh, over a period of time after they've had that kind of pain. Untreated acute pain has uh, potential to produce neurohumoral changes, neural remodeling, neuronal remodeling, and lasting psychological emotional distress, and they always end up with chronic pain. So those are our patients that you see may have had an MI, been undertreated, and now they've always got chest pain. Right? You see those patients. They go in and they get checked and they're fine and everything's good. But that's because they're having real pain and it's chronic pain now based on the fact that it wasn't well treated the first time. So give these guys drugs. And if it's me, get out the big fentanyl <coughs> and give me as much of that as you want. I love fentanyl. I had it when I had surgery. <laughs> Great drug! <laughs> so these are sort of our, uh, in our hands, the initial effects. Increased oxygen demand. What do we need less than increased oxygen demand in our patients that have been either really badly hurt or are, you know, having their MI or any of that kind of stuff? We don't want to increase their oxygen demand. Unless we can match it, and most of the time we can't, right? We can't keep up with what the demand is. It makes them bleed more briskly, too. So you want to drop down that pain level as soon as you can. It starts this whole initial inflammatory response, so they end up with that source that leads to multiple organ um, uh, dysfunction syndrome, and that's what, one of the things that leads to death, right, with sepsis. So just from pain. So what do you guys do? Is Do you assess pain on every patient? For the most part. For the most part? Do you ask them, or how do you do it? Do you just guess? Like most of us do. You put down what you think it might be. <laughs> well, this guy's got it too. Typically, it's zero to ten. That's what most of us do, I think. So the gold standard is ask the patient how much pain they have. I mean, we can we can kind of surmise how much pain they have. Obviously, this faces thing is for people that can't talk, <coughs> can't speak their language. Mm -hmm. It works out well for little kids and old people that if either stroked or had something like that, it will help you kind of figure out how much pain they have. But this, the verbal pain intensity scale is the gold standard. What about for your patients that are unconscious or are, you know, hovering in there? How do you assess pain on them? Vital signs. Vital signs. Vital signs are one indicator, but they're poor. One of the things they looked at in uh, critical care um, <coughs> is that they looked at things that could change vital signs in patients that were intubated and were on sedation. And as much as bumping the bed would change their vital signs up or down, because it increases their metabolic demand, right? So anything that you do, and what, what do we do? We move the patients around. That's what we're here for, right? To put them on a bed and take them somewhere. That may not be a good indicator of pain, but it certainly can be an indicator of changes in their metabolic demand. So kind of in the back way, it is a good way to look at pain, right? Because it does, their heart rate goes up, that means that something is happening to trigger that metabolic demand, and if you can knock that down with pain meds, that's good. So sedation also will come into play with that. So immediate negative effects on our patients, we already talked about that. Long-lasting effect for patients who are under-medicated, so don't be afraid to give them pain meds. Don't be afraid. Don't be afraid of those narcotics. Don't be afraid of the whole craze about no one gets pain meds anymore. They do. And they still get tons of pain meds in the hospitals as well. 
um, it decreases the morbidity and possibly further mortality for those patients. And every patient is entitled to pain assessment and management. So whether you think they're having pain or not, if they describe that they're having 10 over 10 pain for you, medicate them. Just medicate them. Do, it's, I mean, it doesn't cost you anything. You're not going to hurt them. So what if they're a drug abuser? Does it change anything in the continuum for you guys? No, it doesn't. And it's not a problem that we in EMS are going to solve, is that whole drug-seeking behavior. We can't fix that. We can certainly, um, you know, we can, we can certainly take care of patients with acute pain, but you can't fix that whole drug abuse problem. So we're going to talk about these drugs and a couple others. But do you guys carry both, morphine and fentanyl? Yes. What's your favorite drug of those two? Fentanyl. 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 <laughs> well, fentanyl is my favorite drug, too, for pain. I think it's a great drug. And having had it and then also having had morphine when I, was, um, when I had surgery last time, I... Um, Morphine made me barf my guts up with one milligram of it. And fentanyl made me feel so much better, so much quickly, quicker with a tiny little dose of it that I, I, I don't even give morphine to anybody anymore. <clears throat> the other thing I could, I have this, <laughs> I was orienting a new flight nurse. It's been about eight or 10 years ago. And she, I said, you know, what do you want to give the patient, morphine or fentanyl? And she said, oh, morphine. And I said, they're going to barf. And she said, no, they won't. I'm going to give him morphine. So she gave him morphine. The patient started getting a little restless, and I was sitting behind the patient, so I put my face down to talk to her, and she barfed right up inside my helmet, right up inside my visor. It was great. It was a good learning experience for her. <laughs> we had a couple words about that afterwards, but it was all right. It worked out fine. Next time, listen. Listen to me! No, I didn't do that. So all these narcotic, um, narcotic type opioid drugs work the same way basically. Elevates pain threshold in the brain and acts on pain receptors. Um, CNS depressant, respiratory depressant, mild vasodilator, which is good for cardiac patients, right? For a long time they said, oh, we have to have morphine for cardiac patients because it dilates everything it's so much better. And then they did side by side studies of fentanyl and morphine. Fentanyl was as good, so they're on a par as far as vasodilation, so that it, and it does help with preload and afterload for those patients as well. For people in congestive blood. <laughs> yeah, I mean it's new stuff that comes out all the time. And unless you're reading studies all the time, it's hard to keep up on it. <coughs> so contraindications: known allergy and inability to secure an advanced airway should the patient become apneic. So a word about apneic with fentanyl. What patients get apneic with fentanyl? Have you seen it? Uh, concurrent sedation. Concurrent sedation, yeah. So if you give them Versed with it, mm -hmm. Versed with pretty much any opioid does that. But the thing that um, makes these patients do that, and the same thing with ketamine, is giving it as a rapid bolus. So, they, and the other thing they worry about with these patients is mus muscle rigidity particularly involving muscles of respiration, so the chest wall gets rigid in these patients. And that's been reported for, I don't know, God, I was in, in the late 70s I was a nurse, and they told us that then when we used it. We used to use it for procedural stuff, like fix the broken arms, stuff like that, because it's short acting, knocks the patient down, does that stuff. I think I'm giving gallons, I mean seriously, gallons of fentanyl and never seen it happen. So it's super rare, but it does happen. And if it does happen, the thing to fix it with is just the benzo. benzo. So get your verset out and give them a dose of that. And be ready to intubate them because if you give them fentanyl, they have that problem and then you, then you knock them down with verset, then you're going to need to have uh, an area in the patient. <coughs> they can get bradycardic from it. They can get it from anything. Tacky, dysrhythmias. They, they can get hypotension, and I've seen it in a few patients, but not very commonly, right? It's not, that's the drug that keeps them from getting hypotensive if they're going to give them something for pain. They get orthostatic, but who's going to stand their patient up after they've had some for pain? I mean, not very often. And if you are, you're going to be helping them, right? Get from a chair to the gurney or something like that. So I'm not too worried about that. 
Um, respiratory depression or apnea, and apnea is almost always associated with a rapid push. If you're giving them, you know, a big dose of fentanyl and you're going to give it to them, <clears throat> like a hundred of them, a hundred of fentanyl and sh like that, they sometimes will become apnea for a few minutes. CNS, obviously, they get sedated. They have pupils that get small, like all those great opioids do for everybody, so that's normal. They can get nausea and vomiting, but it's not as common as it is with nausea. <coughs> we already talked about this. Slow bolus, and then treat it with benzos if they have that chest bolus. Super uncommon. But you'll see it as a big, a big, you know, caution on everything you read about that now. Uh, dosing, um, the literature says one to three mics per kilo. IV, we usually give them one per kilo, and they can redose if we need to, because you know it's easier to undershoot than overshoot <laughs> for these patients. Um, can be um, repeated every five to 15 minutes. If your patient is hypermetabolic, they have a heart rate that's up for whatever reason, and they're they're chewing up their um, oxygen stores, they're chewing up their glucose stores, they're going to chew up this fast too. So remember, in five minutes you can redose these guys if you need to. Can be given intranasally. And this, I love this drug, because for little kids that you know have trauma, like they have a liver injury that you know is going to need IVs, these sweet little kids that are just laying there crying, being really sweet. Um, you can give them internasal fentanyl, wait a minute, and then start their IVs, and they don't cry, it's not miserable for you, it's not as traumatic for them, and it's one less thing that they'll remember from their little incident with their, you know, kick to the stomach by the horse or whatever. So, you can do this for adults as well, there's no reason not to. I mean, especially if they're having acute pain, you have somebody, you're on the scene, you're waiting around trying to, I mean, you're trying to do all these different things, no reason you can't squirt some fentanyl on their nose while you're getting ready to put them on the bed and then get them in a place where you can start your IV. No reason not to. So we give a lot of internasal fentanyl. I always give it to kids before I do anything else to them, just because it's nice. It's a nice thing to do. So morphine looks about the same for the indications and mechanisms of action. <coughs> You gotta kind of be careful with morphine in patients that have asthma or COPD. Why is that? Say it out loud. I can't hear. The atelectasis. Maybe? You can definitely cause them to have a little atelectasis. Definitely. The thing is, it does a histamine release with morphine, and you'll see, you'll notice, and you probably have seen it in your patients when you give it to them IV. They have a red line that goes up. You can see the red line go up their arm. That's a histamine release. It doesn't mean that it's anything terrible going on, but they can get histamine released immediately from morphine. And so when that happens, for those patients with COPD or asthma, they can have an asthma attack. They can get bronchospasm from it. So morphine is one of those things you want to be very careful about with those kind of patients. Not that you can't give it, and I've given probably gallons of that as well in my career, but um, it is something to know about and think about with those guys. If you have an alternative, it's probably better to use fentanyl for those guys. <coughs> Would you guess that that's where a lot of morphine allergy is? Is that histamine release? I think so, yeah. I think so. And remember, morphine sulfate doesn't mean... So if they're allergic to sulfanamines, mm -hmm. it's not the same. Those are two different kind of classes of drugs. Because I've heard someone say, oh, I'm allergic to sulfa, I can't take morphine. Well, okay, <laughs> but those two things don't really work out that way. So don't let them confuse you with, that, with uh, whatever they think is going on there. Adverse reactions list is a little bit longer, right? Um, they can get all these things, which everybody can get, and headache is reported with every drug, by the way, on Earth, if you look at the FDA circular. Um, so don't be too excited by that. They get blurred vision, double vision. They get respiratory depression from morphine, and we know about that, so we can watch it. <clears throat> they almost always get a little hypotensive from it. Morphine causes a little bit more of a vasodilatory um, effect on the entire body, so they can definitely get um, hypotensive. 
And so that's one of the reasons why all the protocols on Earth say if the blood pressure is below 90, you can't give them anything for pain. And it really has to do with that was our only drug we gave for pain. So um, that, that, if you have a new medical director, that is something that's revisited that small amounts of fentanyl for those patients <clears throat> might still work. Um, it causes some adrenal insufficiency over a period of time. And you mostly see that in uh, patients that are chronically on it, like in hospice with cancer, that kind of stuff. So it's not necessarily an acute pain kind of thing, but you can see adrenal insufficiency. Nausea, vomiting, constipation, it slows down the gut. It doesn't stop it, but it slows it down, so all those things are side effects of it. Urinary retention is real, and you see that surgically on patients within about five hours usually. It happens super quickly. And so your patient that you dropped off somewhere that you gave morphine may not be able to pee for five, six, seven hours afterwards. <clears throat> and so, you know, that ends up buying them a Foley catheter, that could instill bugs in there, and then they end up septic and die. And then we have the whole flushing, sweating, itching. And you see those patients, once they, the med starts working, have you ever watched them? They always go like that, mm -hmm. scratch their nose. That's the morphine working. So super common for them to get itching, and mostly they scratch their nose. That's like, okay, we know the drugs on board now. <laughs> because they're always going to have that little bit of scratching thing from it. <clears throat> That's when the histamine release. 5 to 10 milligrams, about every 15 to 30 minutes IV for adults. Make sure you give them an antiemetic first, or else they will barf underneath your face shield and your helmet, and you'll be covered in smelling stinky all day. Pediatric dose, 0.1 milligram per kilo. Super slow IV. And kids barf from everything anyway, so just give them Zofran first. It's so here's the, the two sides of the same coin. Morphine, the onset is slower. So about 10 minutes it starts to be its peak. Fentanyl, two to three minutes. But at 10 minutes it starts to decrease. So a lot of those patients that we take care of that have like Bad burns, you know they're going to need to have a lot of um, pain meds and just continuous pain meds. We give them a dose of fentanyl and a dose of morphine at the same time. As soon as the fentanyl is wearing off, the morphine has kicked in and it'll sustain them for a longer period of time. And as you see them start to have more pain coming back, give them a dose of fentanyl and a dose of morphine at the same time. Usually you can spread it out 30 minutes that way. And so you're covering their acute pain on the front end, covers it till the morphine kicks in. The morphine goes 15 to, you know, somewhere between 20 and 30 minutes usually. Um, may, morphine can decrease blood pressure. Usually no blood pressure changes with fentanyl. May have the histamine and then the histamine activation with the fentanyl. And that's an analogy to it, which is, I've never seen an analogy to it. <clears throat> so for those painful patients, we talked about that just now. We want to make sure that we, with people that have burns, stemmies, and acute trauma, just give them both. There's no reason not to, unless your protocol prohibits you from using one or the other. Then, you know, if you give them one on the front end and then you know, give them a smaller dose, obviously. You don't want to double dose them up. But if you give them, let's say you give them 100 mics, it's a normal sized person, you give them 100 mics of fentanyl, you can give them somewhere between 5 and 10 of morphine within a minute. And they work so well together to sustain that kind of even thing. It's almost like putting them on a drip. But who of us wants to put them on a drip? That takes forever. It's a lot of work. So they work really well together, though. <clears throat> the hospital is used a lot, right? And you guys take a lot of patients out of the hospital. So <clears throat> this is just a heads up for you for Dilaudid. It's a great drug, super strong. Um, it's about 10 times stronger than morphine. <clears throat> it is super uh, a, a longer onset, peaks in 15 to 30 minutes. So if somebody gives somebody a dose of Dilaudid and says, okay, go to Reno with this trauma patient or whatever, 
expect it's going to be 15 to 30 minutes before you see a really good effect for them. So you may have to dose them with fentanyl before they get to that point. And then the duration, IV duration on these guys is two to three hours. So it's a great drug for patients that you don't want to give morphine to, and you do want to control their pain, and you want it to last a long time. So it's a, another one of those good things. <coughs> but 30 to 40 minutes, they can still get their post-administration um, reactions. It's for all these things, burns trauma, kidney stones. It's great for post-intubation pain. It works really well for that. It's a, it's a good med to use for um, pre-med for RSI, because it lasts a long time for these patients. Um, and then, you know, it works the same as the other ones. It does the same things. It'll cause them to have nausea and vomiting, constipation and ileus. Um, so keep in mind that that happens. They do get bronchospasm with it occasionally. I've seen one patient get bronchospasm when I was working in the hospital in, Mer in Modesto. And um, <clears throat> it was super, s the doc was like, what? <laughs> they can't be having bronchospasm. Well, look at the circular, it says it's right in there. So yeah, they do get it, they can get it. Respiratory just depression definitely, but you know, it's, it works on the CMS, so everything that you give like that. Works on CMS like that. Five times more potent. One to four milligrams for adult slow IV. We usually start with one. It is really, I mean, it'll knock them down. And it takes a long time to start working. That's why I always get mad at the docs in the ER when they say, oh, give them a milligram to do that. I don't feel better. Yeah, well, they're going to bug me for the next 30 minutes when you're out having coffee and going to the next patient. So <clears throat> remember, it's it's slow, slow onset. One to five mics, not milligrams, mics per kilo for kids, right? So um, it, the nice thing is it can be given IV subcutaneously or orally. So what about subcutaneous IV or subcutaneous meds on um, anybody that we take care of? Five to what do you mean? Is it good? I mean, is it something that we want to use subcutaneous? We don't do it Yeah, here's the problem. If you have a patient that has any low flow state at all, anybody with, you know, any hypotension or any tachycardia or any of that kind of stuff, it's just going to sit there for a long time. Mm -hmm. I mean, the muscle cells, yeah, it might work there, but it's certainly not going to work in the fatty area, right? So I always discourage people from doing that. Remember, anything that we talk about IV is also IO. So IV, IO is all the same. There's no difference between those. 7 to 12 minutes is the onset. The duration, one to three hours, all these are from different sources, obviously. But it can last a long time. Um, but it usually usually peaks at about 15 to 30 minutes for their um, peak. Ketamine. Oh, I love ketamine. You guys have to get ketamine. I hope you all come and talk to me about <laughs> Please say it into the camera. <laughs> oh, ketamine is a great drug. It's not an opioid. It dissociates the patient at higher doses. Works really well for pain. <clears throat> it protects and actually sometimes boosts up their blood pressure. What happens at the synapse is it actually releases epinephrine. So catecholamines get released at the, at the synapse with ketamine. It can actually, if they have catecholamines, these are not septic patients, these are trauma patients and, you know, acute things that are going on, it will increase their blood pressure for you and maybe make them better. It works. You guys know about tramadol? You see patients with tramadol? Mm -hmm. If they're on tramadol, none of the opioids will work. Because remember, it's a, that it's a narcotic antagonist. So it has a greater affinity for those narcotic receptor sites. So they're on tramadol and they're out motorbiking or doing something because they have chronic pain. Those guys with the above the boot fractured tib fib are not going to get any release from your morphine or your fentanyl or minimal because the tramadol is already on those receptor sites and it's stronger than the affinity for the other things. So um, we give it for pain to anyone on, on tramadol. It works great. Tell you about my little story. And that was the guy I had. I went and picked up this guy out in the middle of somewhere in Washington County that um, 
was laying out there. No one could get to him. I mean, you could see the fire department trying to come up this dirt road, right? It's like a one single path or whatever. And the ambulance is down the road going, we're not going there. And so we went and landed up there, and it was a guy who worked at um, one of the local hospitals in Reno as rad tech. So he was, we knew him. He's like, oh, God, you know, I fractured my tib fib, and you can see his legs all angulated above the boot. He was dirt bike riding, and he said, you know, what drugs do you take? Oh, I'm on tramadol. So he, I said, well, we're not giving you morphine then. He goes, okay. What can you give me? It really, really hurts. And I said, well, what about ketamine? He said, I don't know what that is. And I said, well, it's going to make you go to your happy place. Where's your favorite place on earth? And he said, the beach in Mexico. I said, well, you got a corona right now, dude. And so, <coughs> hi. Hi. Hi, welcome back. Thanks. So um, I said, we're going to give you some medicine, and I want you to just think about the beach in Mexico. We gave him just a small dose, 25 um, per kilo. And he was like, oh, it's so sunny here. <laughs> it was just, I mean, he did. He dissociated completely, and he went to that beach in Mexico. So it's a great drug. It works super well for pain. You can move him around and, and not hurt him more. That <coughs> hole we're splitting him and trying to get him in the helicopter. It's my favorite drug. <laughs> it's my, did I say that? It's my favorite drug. There really aren't any contraindications. So we're talking about doses here, and when we talk about, we'll start talking about how the dosages work and stuff in the ketamine. Remember the people that are abusing it out there on the street are doing 15 to 25 milligrams per kilo. So, <laughs> we'll keep talking about that. What about polypharm with it? With just it, the... it works differently, right, than everything else. So if they're on, let's say they're on oxy or something, this doesn't work in the same receptor sites. It's not going to potentiate any of that stuff. Because I mean, I... I received some ketamine and I had fentanyl and morphine on board, and it was the worst trip of my life. So it's not like probably didn't give you guided therapy. You've been on a lot of trips, so. <laughs> <laughs> Lots of them. So here's one of the things, and, and I go to the national conference every year and listen to all these really smart docs and nurses talk about drugs and stuff. And one of these guys, is a, he's an anesthesiologist and a ER doctor. And he was talking about ketamine and how he said, you know, remember LSD, the days of LSD, and you have a good trip or a bad trip. The bad trip is when you're having high anxiety, you have a lot of things going on, and then you're getting <clears throat> drunk. And he said, if you can guide the patient to that beach in Mexico before you give ketamine, if they're well alert and able to understand what you're saying, they're going to be on that sunny beach. If you don't, and there's a lot of you know, fervor going on and craziness and maybe the spouse is dead in the car and whatever it is, they're going to be freaked out from the ketamine. So keep in mind that there's two different ways for, for the to go. So what was your situation? <laughs> I got burned. But it would make sense I was freaked out because there's a bunch of Chiefs white shirts sitting right there by me. So. Oh my God. <laughs> <laughs> maybe that was it. Well, high anxiety definitely can do that to you, and it, it'll make you, you'll go, when you dissociate, you will go to whatever, wherever someone's guided you, or whatever is going on in your brain before. So, um, that really is kind of an attestation to the, the place that you really want to... Don't go to the light. You really, don't go to the light, yes, but go to the sunshine. Have your feet with the corona. So the most serious side effect and adverse reaction for this is going to be hypersalivation. And that does happen to patients. And you'll see them all of a sudden start gurgling and snorting. And, I mean, they can be sitting up, still kind of talking to you about stuff, and all of a sudden they have snot coming out of their mouth and nose. And, and so the best thing you can do for that is give them 0.4 milligrams of atropine IV. You can also give it to them, um, you know, subcutaneously, or I am, or how we want, but when they, in when you go into surgery, almost everybody gets 0.4 of atropine before you go into surgery, because it dries up all your secretions, and prevents that, because they give a lot of ketamine in the OR. They've used it for a long time in the OR. <clears throat> 
So the other thing is they had, you know, they talk a lot about the reemergence, those freaky things that come back. Do you, do you have any bad dreams about it or anything like that that comes back? I'm not going to say that in front of these guys. <laughs> <laughs> We've a lot of times, <laughs> that's those super high doses. That's those people we're talking about that are taking 20 milligrams per kilo, right? So those are the people that have that reemergence and then they have like, quote unquote, flashbacks and they have nightmares and night terrors and all that stuff. And that really is not very well documented in the medical literature because we give dinky doses compared to what goes on. I mean, I got on one guy's website, I know my drugs.com or something like that, and he was talking about you know, having 50 milligrams per kilo of it and how <coughs> wonderful it was and how great he felt and how he wanted to redose it, but he ran out. And I was like, God, you're crazy. Um, if you end up with a patient that you think is a little freaked out or you see that scared look on their face once they dissociate, give them a little touch of Reset. One milligram you know, one to two milligrams of Versed, just enough. What that does is it gives them that amnesia for that event. And it also will help guide them out of that kind of freaked out, hyper, you know, metabolic brain thing going on. <clears throat> Has less side effects than opioids. It's not something that's going to be addictive. Now, the guys that get it on the street and have fun with it, I don't know that it's addictive, but they use it on an ongoing basis. I don't know. Where do they get it? Do you guys know? Where is their source? Yeah, like, like horse or something like that. Yeah, but you know, I have horses, and at the vet's office, it's locked up all the time. I'm, jeez, you know, it's like, jeez. The nice thing about ketamine is you can get it intermediately too. It's another one of those drugs that if you have that crazy guy that's going, you know, eight sideways, crazy, scaring you, and you don't really want to get up to him right up the nose, walk away, let him calm down. In two minutes, he's going to be pleasant, much more pleasant. So the dose for acute pain is 0.15 to 0.3 milligrams per kilo. <coughs> and it's slow, super slow IV. You're going to give it, if you give it rapidly, these patients, every one of them go atmic. Mm -hmm. So give it over a minute or so unless you're giving it IM or internasal. So that's the deal with that. And then internasal is 0.7 to 1 milligram per kilo. <clears throat> if you had to do an IM dose, what would you do? If you're doing it for excited delirium, <coughs> which is the sedation piece we're going to get to here in a minute, it's a huge, huge compared to that. <laughs> okay? <laughs> Ten times that dose per right. inch. Okay? So yeah, and that's the person you want to get knocked down pretty quickly. If you give them a dinky dose, they get crazier. If you give them a pain dose, they get crazier. So we'll get to that in a second. So anxiety and agitation are a lot of times manifestations of organic disorders. So what patient do we see most commonly that has anxiety? Impending shock, right? Impending shock. We got this. We got the new protocol for our ground banks in Reno for um, ketamine for um, excited delirium about a year ago. I'd say about a year ago. And when they did, when they did it and they rolled it out, they were, you know, they just had a test group that was doing it. It was all FTOs who were smart guys that knew what they were doing, <clears throat> and the and the um, supervisors that were doing it. So they're the seasoned folks. And um, they decided that they were going to, they had a patient that was, so tell me what you think of this. This guy's on a motorcycle, street vibrations, so just about a year ago, right? Come on. He's coming down Geiger grade. He's 56 or 57 years old. He's gone over the handlebars of his motorcycle. He's lying there in a ditch. And when they come up to put him in spinal mobilization, he thrashes around and is fighting with them. Good rule out. So they gave him. They of course assumed that he was on some kind of a stimulant, right? I don't know why. Most, you know, most of that sort of ends in your fifties <laughs> for most people, not everybody. But so they, because he was not following commands and doing what they said, they gave him 500 of um, 
ketamine IM, 500 milligrams. And then the medical director rolled up, because he was hanging around out there. He said, give him another 500, because he was been three or four minutes and he was still kind of combative and we'll let him put him in the spine mobilization. And then guess what happened? <laughs> a minute later, he's apneic. Mm -hmm. And they tried innovating him 12 times yeah. before the helicopter landed. And then, and they tried once and said, we can't see anything. It's just look, it looks like hamburger down there now. So we're just going to bag him into the hospital. And, you know, he eventually woke up and got extubated. And, so remember that not all anxiety and agitation needs sedation. And that guy, and you guys know as well as I do, that you know, there's a lot of those patients that have other things going on. He his bell rung. So, you know, they did every, they they scanned him from head to toe, they did all this stuff on him, and he had a mild concussion. But because they had this new protocol and were practicing with this new drug and they thought, ooh, he's He's agitated and he is anxious and he's got a high heart rate and all these things are going on. That's excited blurry. Let's give him this drug. And then the medical director, of course, really messed it up by being there. <laughs> so he probably would have been fine with the first dose, but not the same. So remember, recognition of the cause is super important. And that's one of the things they hammer with the um, EMS Physicians Association. They talk about medical, the medical directors association. They talk about you know being able to educate people so that they can recognize what the cause of that anxiety and agitation are. So we're going to talk about these drugs. <coughs> Percent, Tomate, Haldol, and my favorite drug once again for sedation is ketamine. And you can use one dose to give them sedation and pain medication. It would be easier, right? <coughs> So Versed is generally safe. It's a benzo. It's the same as, what are the other drugs? The other benzos? Valium. Valium. Valium, which they stopped making because they couldn't make enough money on it, I think, because it was out of, you know, it got really cheap. Mm -hmm. So, so it's not coming back. I don't think they'll ever get it. They say it's a national shortage, but that's been four years, right? Yeah. For longer. It's a great drug. So, yeah, so Ativan, Versed, those are the ones that we can get now. Short acting, Versed is super short acting, which is nice. How long does it last? For your patients, how long does it last? 10, 15 minutes. Yeah, it's pretty short acting. It can be given IMIV or internasal, so you can shoot that up someone's nose as well. Remember, Valium, you couldn't because Valium is oil-based. So remember those seizing kids a few years ago we were sticking a syringe up their butt and squeezing Valium in there instead of starting IVs. And now, because of the way that that was manufactured, you couldn't stick it up the nose, but the Versed can go in the nose very easily. So you have a seizing kid, you can't get an IV in, and you see them seizing, 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 just give them some in the nose. It works great. Creates amnesia, which we love, because then they don't remember all the things that we've said, <laughs> which may not be all that light. Um, it does cause respiratory um, depression, and especially when it's given with opioids. So give them the pain meds, give them the Brissette if you need to, but remember that they're going to have respiratory depression. If you want them to breathe faster than eight or ten times a minute, you probably need to assist them somehow. Either bag a system or do something to get them to breathe a little bit faster. Really caution with the elderly. <clears throat> so I was working with a new paramedic a few years back who um, had read our protocol that said, you know, go ahead and give five milligrams for the, I don't remember what it was for or whatever. And I said, oh, I wouldn't give that much. That's a little old lady. She'd probably never take anything in her life, not even a Tylenol. And so um, he's like, no, the protocol says five. I think I'm okay with that. And I'm like, all right, so go ahead. <laughs> and so. <laughs> I mean, sometimes the best lessons you learn are yours, right? They're not somebody else's. So he did, and she, of course, went out making that, and we had to try and jump through a bunch of hoops and get her intubated and, and take care of her. So be careful with the elderly patients. For some reason, it really causes respiratory depression and apnea in them. And, and really caution um, the hypotension in sepsis. I would never give it to a septic patient unless I had um, some kind of 
norepinephrine or epinephrine drip running on them first. Because they are going to drop their pressure and they won't get it back. So very cautious with those patients. Caution with anyone that you consider impending shock. So those are the ones that have normal blood pressure and really high heart rate. They have a mechanism that makes you worry that they're going to be shocky down the road. So those are the ones that I'd be super careful about giving Versed to because they will drop their pressure. And, you know, one of the things you can do to combat that a little bit is open up your IV and give them a really good bolus while you're giving them the Versed. So a couple hundred milliliters of IV fluid with the, with the Versed itself. And then I never take a blood pressure for at least five minutes afterwards. I wait five minutes to take the blood pressure because they all go for three or four, maybe five minutes, and then they come back up. So um, intubated patients, dosage for those patients is 0.5 to 5 milligrams every 5 to 15 minutes. Onsets in 30 seconds, super quick. It peaks in about 3 minutes and then lasts between 5 and 15 minutes depending on how much, um, what their metabolism is doing. If they're hypermetabolic, you may need to give it every 5 minutes. And that's okay too. Remember, um, if you have that crazy person you need to sedate, intranasal is the best. The onset's about three minutes, and you don't have a unistic potential. And once they've simmered down, then you can start IVs on them, you can do them IV route, you can do all that kind of stuff. It's just, it, you know, really, it's a game changer to be able to give some of these drugs without having to start an IV on them. Automidate, I'm sure you've seen that given. We use it um, occasionally for RSI, now that we have ketamine, not so much, but it is out there and it's a great drug. We use it in the hospital for procedural sedation. So you break your arm, I gotta straighten it. I'm gonna give you a, a shot of, you know, an IV uh, bolus of Atomidate. It's sh super short um, duration, onset is super fast. Um, it causes apnea in everybody. So expect that for at least three to five minutes, you're going to have to ventilate the patient if you're doing procedural. And then adrenal suppression in 10% of patients, we don't use it on patients that are septic, and particularly children that are septic, because it causes adrenal suppression, and then those kids are the ones that need the adrenal, you know, their adrenals to pump out catecholamines so that they can keep their blood pressure up. Because without that, they're going to be on dopamine really quickly, especially kids. So dosage is only IV. You can't give it any other way. 0.3 milligrams per kilo. You can repeat it times one. It is a quick onset. 30 seconds, they're out. And they're down. Duration is only three to five minutes. So it's, it's a wonderful drug for that kind of stuff, procedural sedation or to sedate a patient prior to intubating them. It's, uh, it's kind of a no-brainer. <coughs> you shouldn't have to redose because three to five minutes is plenty of time to do anything, right? Unless you're doing some crazy thing like a bone marrow biopsy or something. Here's your Haldol. It's a great drug. It really does work. It's best for psychiatric mania. You can get IM or IV. It has pretty slow onset. And a really long duration, right? How long does it last? Should I have seen it? Yeah, it lasts a long time. Um, it takes a pretty big dose. And so I don't know what your protocol says, but the five milligrams, you're going to have to redose. You can do 10 minutes, right? <laughs> yeah. So you can probably, for those, mania, those patients with mania that may have come off of their uh, dopamine you know, drugs, dopaminergic drugs, because they are they're got well from their bipolar disease. <clears throat> Those are the ones that probably are going to take 10 or 3 times before they come back down to where they belong. Um, they get dyskinesia, which is really just, they don't feel right in their own skin sometimes. Patients can from that, usually at the low dose. So at 5 milligrams of that, Sometimes they get what I call the shaky jumpies, <laughs> where they just feel like they're uncomfortable in their own skin. They're not, they're not crazy or wild or anything, but they're just like, oh, I don't know, it doesn't feel right. 
Um, they can give prolonged QT. Haldol, Halperidol, it's the same almost as Draperidol, which was an APSI, good old drug that we used to have. <coughs> and so it, it has that effect. It can cause prolonged QT. The difference is, what do we do? We monitor everybody. So you're not going to have that issue with our patients. And I, and I, you know, I would love to go back to an APSI. Big caution, three different studies showed sudden death in elderly patients, so 75 or older, so even older than me. Um, so you want to use it with caution with patients that have dementia or are having some kind of, you know, seems like a psychiatric outburst that's over 70, 75. Consider something else besides Haldol for them. <clears throat> Contraindicated for Parkinson's patients, it gives them Parkinsonian type, you know, things anyway. So for those patients, you don't want to use Haldol. Use something different if you need to calm them down for whatever reason they've gotten. Because remember, a lot of Parkinson's patients get acute dementia as well. And that's one of the things that's the sequela from having Parkinson's for a long time is they get dementia. Um, dangerous with acute uh, alcohol intoxication. So um, remember, if you have someone that's sloppy drunk, fighting with you, seems like they're crazy, use a different drug than this for them because they can have cardiovascular collapse as well. So um, that's one of the cautions with Haldol. 5 milligrams to 10 milligrams every 10 minutes for acute psychosis, really slow onset, usually takes about 15, 20 minutes, somewhere in there before you really start seeing any effects. IV, <laughs> before you see any effects. And like I said before, sometimes you have to use a bigger dose for these guys. So yeah, hours and hours it lasts, about six hours once you get them down. So um, think about that as you're going down the road and you're wondering what you're going to do with this patient. This is probably the great drug to take the patient somewhere else. If you're having to haul them someplace else, Make sure they have a lot of um, how they're on board, and then you can just you know cruise and watch their QT interval, and you know they'll be calm and quiet for you. Can I say I love ketamine? <laughs> I love ketamine. It's the best sedation too. It works in air. It works for everything. <coughs> we already talked about the fast onset preserves their airway and respiratory drive. A lot of those patients that you're just using it for initial sedation on. Even these guys that have, um, you know, excited delirium, if you sit them up in the bed, give it to them and talk to them, they will continue talking to you calmly, quietly. Oh, that's a great drug. I love this drug. Preserves their blood pressure, may even increase it. So when we first came out with ketamine, they were all worried about giving it to patients with head injuries. Now they've proven it's neuroprotective. It's a great drug for that because it doesn't let the blood pressure fall. And hypotension um, is one of the big killers in, in close head injuries, right? So the, that is one of the things that you want to preserve is a higher CPP for those patients. So you want to be able to keep their cerebral perfusion pressures up so that they, they don't have areas around the injury that have lost circulation. So that's what you worry about with the low blood pressure. Shortish duration, it's not real long. Great for RSI, great for hypotensive patients. We give this to our patients um, as a pre-medication that we're going to innovate that have um, sepsis. Because it'll at least preserve what blood pressure they have and may augment it unless they've been sick for a long time. Trauma and head injury patients, 100% of the time. 100% of the time for sedation as well as for pain. You can give it IVIMIN, excited delirium, four to six milligrams per kilo, either IM or IN. So it's a big dose, right? But it's a lot smaller than the guys we're talking about on their other little website about you know how they how they abuse it. I'm gonna send them an email and say, how do you get this stuff? Probably have the FDA at my house, right? <laughs> For, uh, so for excited delirium, that big dose. For procedural sedation or for premedication for um, RSI, it's one to two milligrams per kilo of IV or IM. And then for pain, 0.3 to 0.5. We, sh we usually shoot for 0.5. It's easier to calculate. And um, 
you know, there it's it's not a huge dose. It's a dinky little dose. So you're given 50 milligrams of man. I mean, it's super simple to use. Um, the caution is give it over a minute, or else they're going to be apneic. And their apnea usually is pretty transient. It lasts somewhere between three and five minutes with the apnea. And then they start breathing again on their own. You may have to help bag a system for a little bit if you get it too quick. And then it lasts around five minutes. So just get it slowly. Yeah. One of the things that we usually do is we'll dilute it in a, a 10 or 20 milliliter syringe and just give them a milliliter every few seconds, every five or six seconds. And it works super well. Questions? Any other drugs you want to know about? Uh, more of a question. So if you have a, you kind of touched on a little bit, but if you have a pediatric seizure, what's your preferred, preferred dose for, uh, preferred route for uh, per set? Would it be IN or IN? I think IN is the best dose for that. Yeah. Is it faster IN? acting? Yeah. I, okay. Intranasal is much quicker. That, yeah, mm -hmm. intranasal so. Yeah, it re especially in kids. Remember, they mm -hmm. haven't messed up their noses and they don't have like, um, they haven't put things in them other than peanuts and stuff, but yeah. they, they, they don't have problems with their mucosa and it, it's rapidly absorbed. In fact, that's one of the things that they, you can give them in a sucker, mm -hmm. so it can be even, you can even put it in their mouth and have it absorbed that way as okay. well. But it tastes nasty, so they'll be spitting it. So it's better probably just to shoot it up their nose and they'll cry mm -hmm. and cough a little bit. But it's not like poking them. Yeah. And it'll definitely stop their seizure by the time you get the IV in. Mm -hmm. So that's all good. What else can I answer for you? All right, awesome, guys. Thank, thank, you, you, thank, you. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Barb. Thank you, Barb. You're welcome. Sure. You're welcome. So we're going to talk about sedation, what do you